physics YouTubers versus a problem from the British Physics Olympiad. As you can notice, I am not at home filming in front of my whiteboard. I'm joined here in Lewis's Physics Online amazing studio. Yeah, you can't really see the rest of the studio. We've got kind of like the white background here, but there's like various cameras and bits and pieces. Uh, and lots of Lego. Yeah, quite lot, too much Lego actually. Maybe, <laughs> maybe too much. It's, a, it's an obsession, but you know, there we go. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so what are we going to do today then? So today we thought we would have a look at the Senior Physics Challenge from the British Physics Olympiad. You guys have seen me solve quite a lot of Olympiad problems, so I thought it would be perfect to see Lewis's approach to some of those really interesting problems. These are sat in year 12. So shall we have a look at the paper? Yeah, so, so this one here, um, yeah, Senior Physics Challenge 2022 paper. So if you want to find it, I think there's a link beneath this, is there? Yeah. If you want to have a go at some of these Just questions and some more. Okay, there's also, they give some constants, volume of a sphere, so I think the kind of stuff you get in your data book anyway, mm -hmm. so there's, we'll see if we need those. So, where, where should we begin? Well, we've got a list of problems over here. Let's throw a small selection of the problems. Looking at them, I do like a diagram. Do you like a force diagram? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. yeah. Let's do the force diagram. So we're going to start with question two. So, so these ones are like multiple choice, uh, one mark for each correct answer. And we've got a block on the slope. So this is kind of standard physics, probably replicated up and down the country. I actually have what I, I found as a teacher, this is one of my favorite <laughs> things. It's so simple, basically a wooden slope. Uh, you can easily adjust the angle uh, and you can put something on there. Got, I'd actually have a wooden block, but I do have a block coming out of Lego. So, <laughs> so this is kind of like what we have there. It actually gives us the forces. Now, something I noticed about this is there still isn't agreement amongst teachers about where you actually draw your arrows from. <laughs> so on the diagram, they've got the weight acting down, acting from the center of gravity of this object. Uh, they've got the normal contact force acting from where it's contacting and touching. And then you've got sort of friction sort of acting up here. So on this diagram, they've got the forces, I suppose, from where they're acting. But other times we draw, we can draw them, I think, completely legitimately, maybe just from the same points. So you might have weight from the center, the normal contact force from the center and friction from the center. There's there's not 100% agreement, is there? Yeah, I think typically in those problems, that's a really good point, actually. the uh, We just assume that it's, I think they call it a material point in physics. Basically, you assume that everything's a point, kind of a typical physics assumption. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to take moments and it yeah, gets cool. more so, interesting. So this is our point source of, of stuff. So um, basically, this is... I think brilliant. I think every yeah. every classroom should have one of these. I agree. So um, I'm propping mine on a textbook normally, by the way. So I'm probably going to get one of those. <laughs> so uh, so my approach would be is something like this. I'm just going to draw the diagram out again. Okay. So this is kind of the, the triangle, like this. Okay. We've got a vertical line down there, and that's at 90. Uh, we've got theta one. Um, this is kind of my point source, but I'm going to have mg acting down. I'm going to have um, the frictional force FF here, and I've got the normal contact force, which is at 90 degrees to that surface, like that. We've got this angle here, which is theta 2. Now, that's a right angle triangle, mm -hmm. and that angle in there looks like 90 degrees, but it doesn't say that. It just, you've got theta 2, theta 3. So, to some extent, we know that angle there. This angle here, if that was 90, then C, theta 3 should be the same as theta 1. But we don't know that because we don't know how long that is. So I think that's kind of like an irrelevance. Yeah, just looking at those as well, theoretically, it shouldn't really make a difference what we put put here, whether it's a Lego block, whether it's a drop off, etc. Yeah. The physics on this side should be the same. So if there's any answers that involve theta 3 and theta 4, uh, I think we're probably safe to eliminate that. Yeah, absolutely, you know what? yeah. yeah. So there's any one of those, yeah. So, so it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter how long, you know, that's still a right angle triangle, so all of those can be ignored. I'm then going to, I suppose, if sort of thinking about the, um, the component of the weight, which is perpendicular to the slope, we've got this kind of line down here. If that's theta 1, then this angle here is theta 1 as well. And this angle here is theta 2. So I've just kind of basically replicated those angles. Which of the following could be equal to the magnitude of the frictional force on the block? So here, if we think about the forces which are perpendicular to the slope, it's stationary on a rough surface. So if it's stationary there, that means the sum of forces is going to be 0. And that means the size of the frictional force up the slope 
is equal to the component of weight acting down the slope, so this kind of component down here. So that's equal to mg, and then that would either be equal to mg cos theta 2, yep. or that's equal to mg sine theta 1. Okay, so... Absolutely spot on. I think we've solved this, actually. So both of those are correct, but looking up here, um, anything with a component of the normal contact force can't be related to the frictional force because they're at 90 degrees. So I'd say it's not that one or that one. And then looking at these two, uh, mg cos theta 2 is this one here. So that's correct. That one is mg sine theta 2. Well, it can't be sine and cos theta 2 anyway. So one of those must be incorrect. And we know that's the correct one. So that's not true. So Absolutely I would say spot on. 2c. All right. Um, Probably spot on. I think for an Olympiad question, that's a nice warm-up. And actually, anybody doing A-level physics or IB physics should be able to do that kind of thing. And yeah, so we're looking at forces in equilibrium, uh, resolving forces perpendicular to a slope, and then just identifying some angles. Fantastic. In the next question, we're going to have a look at an electron volt and a snail. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Question number three. Energies in particle accelerators are measured in electron volts. Actually, in the Large Hadron Collider, they reach tera electron volts. Off topic. Which is a fraction of a joule. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind of crazy. It sounds more, when you say it in electron volts, does it? It sounds more impressive. Absolutely, yeah. What is the kinetic energy to an order of magnitude in electron volts of a snail of mass one gram, which crawls along at a rate of one centimeter in 10 seconds. So we're going to imagine that there's been some careless scientist or engineer, a snail has got into the Large Hadron Collider and it's just crawling on really slowly. I'll probably put an animation where I'm editing <laughs> a snail crawling along. So the first thing, so kinetic energy. So I'm just going to go straight into the kinetic energy. Uh, we know this is equal to a half mv squared. We need to know the mass. So the mass of that snail is one gram. So that's 1 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. Oh, yeah, it's a half time that, isn't it? A half times yep. 1 times 10 to the minus 3. And what would the speed be? So we've got a rate of pretty 1... Pretty slow. <laughs> yeah, so 1 centimetre. This is, I think, even for a snail, pretty slow. But we know that uh, the speed is equal to the displacement over the time. The displacement is 1 times 10 to the minus 2 metres in 10 seconds. So 1 times 10 to the minus 2 divided by 10 is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 3. So this is times 1 times 10 to the minus 3 squared. So we've basically got 0 0.5 times 1 times 10 to the minus 3 times 1 times 10 to the minus 6, uh, which is 0 0.5 times 1 times 10 to the minus 9. Obviously, we can't really leave... I think 0.5 times 10 to the minus 9, yeah, that's what we could say 5.0, or just 5, whatever, times 10 to the minus 10. So that's kinetic energy. Out in joules, isn't it? Okay, so yeah, at the moment, because we've done uh, mass in kilograms, speed of meters per second, that's our energy in joules. So that's not the answer. But uh, an electron volt, it's basically the energy gained by an electron acceleration through a PD of one volt. And we know that... Remember the, that for the exam. Yeah, and the energy is equal to charge times potential difference. So effectively E equals QV, or uh, one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Okay, so I think that's given to you in your data book. It's kind of something you should remember, um, I feel anyway. It's just yeah. a, a common kind of conversion between these two. So basically, that's the number of joules. That's the amount of electron volts per joule. And therefore, the kinetic energy is going to be equal to 5.0 times 10 to the minus 10 joules divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. You probably don't even need a calculator because it's asking us to... Um, order of magnitude, isn't it? About the order of magnitude, yeah. run the exact answer. If in doubt, always just use a calculator just to double check things. Okay, so let's go with that. Uh, 5 divided by 1.6 is about 3-ish. And then we've got 10 to the... We've got mm, minus, mi minus, 10. minus 10 over minus 19, which is plus 9 times 10 to the 9. So I would say then, looking at these, that's... Well, we've got 10 to the 9, so that's going to be giga. 
Yeah, um, I agree. So it's definitely not Omega, which would be 10 to the 6. Definitely not Terra, 10 to the 12. The order of magnitude is, I think, D. But this is a thing that I, I've done. I think that I think I'm correct. Um, I think you definitely are. Ten to the minus nineteen. But I always like to double check. Um, and Excellent yeah. habit. Yeah. So it's three point one two five times ten to the nine. So perfect. That's all right, isn't it? <laughs> so um, you don't even need a calculator for these questions. I know. <laughs> ne also, next time you see a snail just crawling along, you know, remember that it might be going. They might have an energy of about three times ten to the nine, three giga electron volts. Who knew? So, so that giga electron volt, that's kind of the or, like the kind of energy of a particle, isn't it? In yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, in some particle accelerators, I think at CERN, they, I think last year they reached thirteen point three tera electron oh, okay. volts, okay. which uh, more than a snail. Which, yeah, which is more than a snail, but that's the energy of an individual proton, which weighs nothing. So that's actually accelerating them pretty close to the speed of light. But anyways, we digress. Should we have a look at the next question? Yeah. So this here is a typical example of a longer question. Um, we've got the first part starts with a little pendulum here, and then we've got a YouTube, and we kind of like YouTube, don't we? Yeah, YouTube's pretty good, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so there's no problem about YouTube. Well, pendulum first. Yeah. So what is this problem asking us? So we've got a small ball of mass m. The very fact that they've given us the mass m probably means that we're going to have to be working in symbols. That's one of the things that's a little bit different in the Olympiad compared to A-level physics, I think. Yeah, yeah. So it's like we're not just trying to find a, a number. We're kind of writing an expression. Oh yeah, here we go. Write an expression for the first bit. Okay. So I think this one here. When I first saw this, I thought that's the pendulum, which is going to be oscillating from side to side. And you know, so I'm thinking about you know the time period equals mm -hmm. two pi root l over g. But it actually says here, the point of attachment is accelerated to the right with a constant acceleration. So the string hangs at an angle. So basically, this is a picture, like a kind of snapshot in time, of the whole thing moving along. So this is kind of like, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's not going further back. It's not hanging down like this. It is kind of like just being accelerated to the, in that direction. The right expressions for the horizontal and vertical components of the force on the ball, in terms of m, g, t, a, and uh, theta. Sounds like another force diagram to me. Yes, yeah, so my my approach to this would be, I'm just gonna draw a quick sketch diagram. So here is the ball. There's gonna be a force vertically down due to its weight, but we don't know its weight, but we know that's equal to the mass times the gravitational field strength. Now the, f the, the other force acting on this is gonna be provided by the tension in that string, okay, and I think that's the only thing that's touching it. There's nothing else. Are we assuming no air resistance? There's no air resistance. It, it's not mentioned, so we're going to assume that's negligible. Yeah, this whole thing is in a vacuum. Yeah, so that's the tension, and that's at an angle of theta up here. And I guess, uh, what's your favourite angle? Is it a Z angle? <laughs> yeah. So we've got a Z angle there. That's a, that's a new channel just, yeah. just about to start. Uh, so we've got the same angle theta here. So I think that's that's a nice thing to kind of just put it on there. Yep. Um, and I would say that in the vertical direction, you've got a vertical component of tension, which is equal to the weight acting down. So it's not moving up or down. But there's going to be a horizontal component of tension acting in that direction, which is providing the resultant force in it, which causes it to accelerate. It's a bit like when you've got something moving in a circular path, so you, say, for example, you had like it's a... It's exactly what I was thinking, because if they're moving in a circular path, one of these provides the frictional component that makes something turn, essentially the centripetal force, isn't it? So it's the exactly. same maths applied to non-circular non, non -circular yeah, but, motion. Yeah, but you could have like a, a, like a conical pendulum. So this is like a mm. pendulum on a string that's just spinning in a circle. So the force on the ball in the vertical direction, so Fv is equal to zero, because effectively what we can say is that mg is equal to t, like a closed angle there, so mm -hmm. t cos theta in the vertical direction. Horizontally, so fh for the horizontal force, that's going to be equal to t sine theta. And here that force, Newton's second law, f equals ma, t sine theta is equal to m. I think that's pretty much the simplest form that we can express this, isn't it? Because there's no other forces um, yeah, so, acting on there. So that's the resultant force on the ball causing the mass of that ball to accelerate. Is that right? Yeah, looks right to me. Cool. 
Okay, not so bad to begin with. So this <laughs> is just like force diagrams. Right then. Gain an expression for the angle of the string to the vertical in terms of A and G. Now, I have to admit, when I first did this problem, uh, I'm probably going to put my solution up here. I uh, I do like rearranging equations, so I did, um, I found T in terms of the angle, then I used the fact that sine over cos is actually equal to tan, and then I came up with the same expression. But Lewis here just spotted something which was, uh, now that I see, seems obvious, but yeah, what did you spot? Yeah, so uh, I guess looking at the triangle here, um, I might just draw it out one more time. So we've basically got, uh, this is kind of like that tension side there. Mm -hmm. We've got like this side of a triangle and this side here. Um, they're at uh, 90 degrees through one another. That angle is theta. And if we think about that being the hypotenuse, that being the adjacent and that being the opposite side. Well, we know that the opposite side here is this length here, and that's equal to MA. And the adjacent side is going to be equal to MG. Now, we've... Um, got the adjacent opposite uh, what's theta well we can say that um, you know uh, tan theta which is equal to the opposite over the adjacent is equal to m a over m g obviously they cancel and therefore tan theta is equal to a over g so I suppose I did it sort of visually looking at a triangle thinking well if we know the length of that side in terms of the force and the length of that side we can work out what the angle theta is. And so, this is literally a few lines once you spot. So I think it's really important in the Olympiad to be looking at that relationship between the actual forces and just pure geometry. It's something that I've seen come up quite quite a few times. Yeah, so um, that one there, actually quite a nice question, I thought. And um, It's yeah. also unusual, isn't it? Because the whole thing is being accelerated. So normally you would have it just swinging, performing simple harmonic motion. Yeah, and I think that's why it's important to read the question as opposed to assuming what the question is going to ask you, because you could look at that and go, well, it's something to do with like, you know, some harmonic motion, but actually it's it's a normal thing that you're probably really used to seeing, but it's like just done differently. Yeah, I agree. Okay, okay so. Right. Um, what have we got next? Right, so. We've got the YouTube finally. Yeah, so. We'll do um, a question about YouTube on YouTube, world's first or second, because we did a similar one. Yeah, we did. Channel. Yeah, so um, we did some other videos as well. So in addition to this one, uh, if you want to see even more kind of difficult uh, problems from the Olympiad, or like challenging but quite fun problems, uh, we did a video that you can find over on my channel. And also we've done some other ones with some, uh, I suppose actually kind of, actually probably similar questions, but the ones that came up in previous uh, papers. So yeah, have a look around. We've got plenty more there. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so let, let's have a look at the YouTube thing, so. In the YouTube, half a wood water, which is right over here, we're given the cross-sectional area, the YouTube has a horizontal acceleration A to the right in the plane. Okay, so we take the tube and then we accelerate the whole thing to the right. We've got a tube there, haven't we? Oh yeah, we do, look at this. Whoa, look at that, we've got a tube now. Let's see if I do this without spilling water all across your studio. Ah. <laughs> I, so I think, and I tried this earlier actually, it's difficult to do because you've got to have that constant acceleration and it's very easy to accelerate and then yeah. it goes at a constant velocity, so... I'm going to try and put this in yeah. slow motion in the edit. I have no idea if it will work. I think it definitely does it, but... And here is a snapshot where you can see the effect. Sort of. <laughs> it's difficult because you've got to get faster and faster and faster. Um, oh. Also, I promised the technician that we wouldn't break any YouTubes in the, in the course oh. of filming this video. I'm sorry, technician. Definitely something happens. <laughs> it's very difficult to see. Yeah. But yeah, so um, it does. If, and if, if you have at school, if you get, you know, ask your teacher, there'll probably be a big dusty pile of these in the chemistry lab somewhere. Um, but have a go with some YouTubes and some water. I think um, chemists use them quite a lot. I think they might do, yeah. I don't know what for bubbling stuff through it and coloured water in, in <laughs> test tubes. That's, that's what they do, isn't it? Okay, so, um, right. So it's, I think this is quite difficult because there's a lot of information just given in text and you're trying to visualise what's going on there. So, Oh, you've got a sketch. I think you quite like sketches. I do, yeah. So we're going to sketch the YouTube with the water levels in the tube showing the water surface on each side. So I would say then that the initial thing for this is actually relatively straightforward, um, which is basically just drawing a YouTube. So the sketch doesn't have to be perfect. So they've got something. I'm trying to resist to do a pun every time he mentions yeah. the word YouTube. Okay, so this is this is a tube. Now, 
there will be a height difference in the level of the water. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing where it's, unless you've got one to actually try and look at. Should we have a look at that one again, actually? Yeah. So as we go from one side to the other, Okay, so this is something that you don't have the advantage to if you're doing the Olympiad. <laughs> it's actually the, it. the water level, it's not, it doesn't just do that. In actual fact, it kind of tends to tilt a bit like, I suppose, if you had a cup of tea, which I do have a cup of tea, mm. um, if you were to kind of suddenly accelerate that cup of tea, the whole surface tends to sort of slosh to one side. Like if you had a bucket of water and you kind of just, you know, yanked it, you'd see that the water kind of does that. Every physics teacher has done that at some point. So I'm going to get my, I can't find, here we go, I've got a ruler here. And I'm going to use the ruler to kind of put in the surface of the water like that. Okay, so I sort of followed it up a bit, bit smeary, but yeah, basically the water goes at an angle. And just like it would in the bucket where it's just one surface, it's now just like split into two surfaces. Um, Another way to think about this mathematically as well is to just consider the uh, the forces which are actually acting. So if we have a force that is accelerating something uh, to the right, if we have another force which is going down, if we were to put these sort of tip to tip to tail, um, we're going to see that a water particle will tend to go in this direction to an observer from the side. Cool. So um, I think that's it, isn't it? Sketch the YouTube with the water levels. Um, that's quite nice, that. Three yeah, marks. there we so go. Three marks. Three marks. Whoa. No. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Um, I think, I'm pretty sure that's right. Yeah, I think it's... Showing the water surface on each side. We've got, there's a height difference in the levels. Oh, okay. So I'm just going to put, for my own sake, from the midpoint there mm -hmm. to the midpoint over here, that's H. And we know that the distance between the centres is L. Okay, mm -hmm. but I think, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. I think the next part is probably the one which, which, which was the hardest for me. Um, the arms of the tube are a distance L apart by considering the forces on a thin disk of water in the tube or otherwise deduce an equation relating H, A, G and L. I think here we had a, a bit of a difference in approach. Yeah, well, didn't I, th we? I think I kind of looked at a triangle as well. So I basically looked at this and I mm -hmm. thought, well, look, there's basically a triangle that does that. Okay. Now for that triangle, and maybe we'll see how this goes. So that height is H, that's L, and then this angle here is going to be equal to theta. And again, we've got our um, hypotenuse uh, adjacent and opposite. And I say then that uh, tan theta is equal to the adjacent over the opposite, which would be h over l. But we don't know. Oh no, we know h and l, but we don't know theta. Mm -hmm. But previously, we worked it out here that tan theta is a over g. So we can say that a over mm -hmm. g is equal to h over l. Yeah, and due to geometry, I think this angle here is going to be equal to this angle here. Yeah. Um, so that's actually the force, essentially due to pressure that the fluid is uh, is um, is exhibiting. I did this approach a little bit differently in terms of forces by considering this angle mm -hmm. and the whole pressure force acting at an angle. Because if we think about it, um, if you are a uh, um, if you are in this tube that's being accelerated, then according to your frame of reference, you are going to experience a fictitious force that essentially gravity will just change its angle all of a sudden. Yeah. It would be the same as if you were in a lift that was suddenly, I don't know, moved to the side or something horrible like that. Yeah. So um, I thought actually that question, I, I suppose, I think what, what really helped with this is drawing a diagram and actually considering the forces involved in it. But then having it on a visual thing there kind of, you know, I, th I think also relating as well. There must be a reason why you did that bit for part A. Like part A kind of warms you up. It gets you thinking about the force at an angle, um, which means when you go to part B, you're kind of continuing the same kind of physics kind of thread. And there's often links from one bit back to the other. So, um, I mean, that was my approach. I'm sure there's probably other approaches that you can take. Hopefully I'm correct with that. It seems to have got the right answer. So that's good. That's um, absolutely fine in my book. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, so I think that that is... If you're maybe at the end of year 13 and you've spent, you know, lots of time doing a level physics, you should be able to do lots of these questions from the year 12 Olympiad. They're obviously challenging there for students in year 12, aren't they? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, if you're preparing for these, just by taking part, just by going through these, just by watching those videos, you are actually being exposed to brand new type of problems and you're getting more experience with more physics situations. If a similar thing was to appear, let's say on A-level physics, or if you're doing, let's say, engineering at university, mm -hmm. your brain will already be accustomed to these physics situations. And this is precisely why you should do a lot more practice and you should have a look at Lewis's video <laughs> on his channel, which we looked at some much harder problems, which are a lot lot of fun and uh, this video is right over here so you have to click on that one thank you very much uh thank you for, for having having me in the video and stuff like that thank you very and, much uh, for having me in the studio good luck everybody thank See you ya. cool that was awesome yeah, yeah good that was nice